Okay, um, good evening everybody. Most of you know me. Um, I'm Tom Payne. I've been a Go developing in Go since about 2014. Um, by day, I currently do aircraft uh, collision avoidance systems, um, but I have a lot of open source Go projects. Um, the most popular, which is Shenhua, dot file manager, just went over 10k stars, yay. <laughs> um, this talk cover is uh, based on a practical tool that I needed for work. It's, um, Dan said this would be a high level uh, talk, but not, this is really a sort of beginner intermediate talk. Um, what I hope if you're, who here is a rough beginner in Go? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay, intermediate level, who says intermediate? And advanced. Okay, right, so if you're a beginner, this I think is a good example of where Go shines as a language. Um, if you're intermediate, hopefully it'll give you an example, some example code to look at, and if you're advanced, please spot as many bugs as you can. <laughs> uh, there is concurrency, so I'm sure there will be bugs. Okay, so the project I'm going to talk about is, uh, it's just a couple hundred lines of code, it's called Find Duplicates, and it finds duplicate files quickly based on a SHA-256 uh, hashes of their contents. But before we go on to that, I mean, how would you find um, duplicate files, i.e. identical contents on your machine? What sort of tools or techniques would you use? Any ideas? Yeah? By, by, by comparison. By, by, by comparison, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Find and hash. Yeah, find and hash, yeah. So what's so, the this is what we're going to do. We're going to start, we're going to basically walk um, some directory. It's part number one. Then we're going to, um, this is going to give us a list of files. And then we're going to hash each file, say. And then we've got a list of uh, files plus hash. Uh, and then we're going to find um, our duplicates, which is any hash which has more than one file with it, and then we'll um, emit our output. So that's the rough overall strategy, but I think we can do better than this. Um, so, what sort of are there any sort of shortcuts we can take? We can think of or things. Sort of, at the moment, we're going to visit every single file. We're going to hash every single file. Yeah, so you, you could you could hash the prefix of the file and then check. Whether the hash of the prefix match. Yep. Turn it right. Yep. Maybe instead of hashing, like you can find by compare just the prefix of the file for standards and Yep. It's cheaper. Good idea. Yep. Compare the inodes. Oh, yes, good one. The inodes. Uh, does that make sense to people? When in which case would the inodes be identical? Exactly, they have to be hard links. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what is an inode? Oh, question who knows what an inode? Who, um, do you want to explain? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that if you want. So, ChatGPT explains that. I think it's basically a representation of a file system. So, if you open a file with OS.open and then file name. Um, it will look up uh, the inodes, and the inodes represent the different blocks in the file system. So um, usually files are not one consecutive uh, memory block somewhere on disk or in memory, but uh, usually they are structured in some way in the file system. And um, I, I would give a different answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My answer. Is, uh, yeah, different. and I know is basically the metadata about a file. Uh, it includes things like. The file name, its size, its permissions, its type, that sort of thing. And then further information like where to find its actual bytes on disk, which I think is fine. So the inode is the metadata, uh, not the contents. And when you have a, a hard link on a file system that supports those, you'll have two inodes will have this point to the same data on disk. A soft link is a file name basically containing a short string, which is the name of the location on disk. Restrictions between the soft links and hard links? Any ideas? Exactly, hard links must be on the same file system. If you delete um, hard links, then as long as you've got one reference back, it's a bit like garbage collection, the thing stays. With soft links, there's no such link between the link and the target. 
Um, well, no, it's, sorry, there's going to be a little bit of system stuff in this. Um, can files, let's say, of different sizes have identical contents? Can files of different sizes have identical contents? Depends on how you define by size. Data. Okay, go on. If, if it's file size on this, then the yeah. answer will be yes. If it's the file size computed by reading to the file, then no. Yeah. We know the final size of, of this. If, even though it might be allocated, say, minimum of four kilobytes on disk, the inode will record, record that it's, say, 100 bytes long and will only ever read the first 100 bytes. So no, if, if files have different sizes, then they can't have the same contents. Um, finally, we can do all this stuff concurrently, because this is Go. So I'm just going to give you the um, overall, what the code will look like, and then we'll actually just dive in and look at the code. We're going to start off by walking uh, our directory. This is going to produce a list of files and sizes. Then we're going to find only files where um, the number with that size is greater than or equal to, say, 2, because if we have different size files, they can't be identical. Then uh, this produces a new list of files and sizes. Then we're going to hash these. And as soon as we find a couple of files with the same size, we can start hashing them. We could use the prefix thing that uh, you mentioned. I have not implemented this in this one. This produces a list of files and hashes, which we then need to reduce into basically a map from a hash uh, to a list of file names. And then finally, we find all uh, where you know, two or more with the same hash, excuse my handling, with the same hash. I can't even read this. And uh, finally, we emit our JSON. So this is um, the overall flow. Uh, if you were to write this as um, a tree, and I'll make this a little bit bigger, um, you're probably all, uh, sorry, it's the icon thing. Is that in the bush? That's a little bit bigger. Uh, roughly speaking, you would do, if you offer the find command, uh, finds a path. This finds a list of all files. And then you would use something like XR, char256, some I think so. I've got what it is on the char sum. Um, oh, great, of course. There's things with space in them, so I need to do a print zero. This is to cope with spaces in file names. And now we have a list of um, uh, checksums out and hashes and file names. Here's it's Unix pipes we're using connecting together. We're going to do this in Go, so we're going to do this with channels. And um, let's go into the code. So let's make this bigger. Is that too big? That's no, too big. Yeah. <laughs> That's better. Okay. So. Hashes, we're going to use SHA-256. We've got a couple of types for paths with size and path with hashes. Um, a little trick here, if you know the file is empty, then you could already know what its SHA-sum is. Go for it. Quick question, why is it like SHA-256? Do you expect a lot of collisions? Because it's not going to be there. I expect no collisions, hopefully. I just chose a random good hash function. Because it yeah. could have been faster, even faster than your own files. Or yes, files. indeed. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> CRCs, you mean by the time you're checking uh, a few hundred thousand files, which was my particular use case, I was um, uh, looking for map tiles, actually, which were lots of little file, files, about four kilobytes in size, <coughs> and there was enough of them that was likely to be collisions with something like CRC32. But still, it would probably be better to use a non-cryptographic hash, right? Like yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What's this one called? Hybrid hash. How do you spell that? Oh, highway hash. Ah, yes. I've heard of that. Cool. Excellent. I will check that out. A couple of minutes more, and you have to be honest.
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to skip over that for a sec. Here's our concurrent walk directory function. Um, so uh, Go standard library has a walk function, which basically calls a function for every file or for every entry in a um, in a subdirectory, recursing into subdirectories. This is a version of it that goes uh, does this concurrently. Um, the main key thing here is we read our list of directory entries from the directory. Then we create an error group. I'm going to show you the dot for this in a sec, which is basically a pool of Go routines which are uh, tied together um, with a context and will catch the first one that returns an error. Then we simply iterate over our, our directory entries, um, calling our callback function. This function this follows the conventions of IFS walk there, and there's, there are special values that can be returned. Uh, skip all means if it returns the error, skip all, then uh, quit everything. If it returns FS skip der, then um, you just skip that subdirectory. Um, otherwise, we spawn a go routine in this group to walk concurrently into the subdirectory. Uh, I'll show you the. Um, there is a great set of extra Go code in golang.org slash exp. Um, is it here? Or oh, golang.org slash x. This is a lot of code here. Some of it is experimental, like the new logging package that was initially developed, um, I think, in golang.org slash x slash slog. Um, there's a lot of code here that might make it into the standard library in the future. And generally, it's very high quality, uh, solid uh, code. And if you have what you feel is probably a common problem in Go, it's well worth having a look in here for it. This particular one is sync error group, which is a very simple, uh, um, very simple API. As you can see, it's pretty obvious what all these, these things do. So I'm not going to go into them. All we care about is with con uh, creation, the constructor with context, the Go to run the actual um, Go routine, and then the wait, which returns the error from the first uh, Go routine, which causes an error, if any. So now we have our concurrent walk, work door, uh, a concurrent walk, um, and now we can concurrently walk the uh, file system. I skip ahead to the main function, and then we look for the next bit. So, um, actually, I'll do the rain first here, and I will put this. I'll put this side by side so you can see. So, uh, so on the left, I'll show the high-level control code, and on the right, we'll go into the um, the actual code itself. So I'll get the main function up. So our main function is here, pass command line arguments, pretty obvious. Create an overall error group uh, to synchronize our Go routines. And first, we're going to be uh, generating the, uh, the paths um, by size, which is this find regular files function. Make that a bit smaller, you can see more of it. This calls our concurrent walk to a function. For each, if it's not a regular file, then we skip it. Otherwise, we read it. Otherwise, we read its inode. Uh, we get its size, and then we write to a channel um, this this result. So now we've through the channel, we've decoupled the um, the reading of the, the file system uh, from the generation of the list and files. Stage two is um, uh, generate the paths with size uh, to hash. This is find paths with identical sizes. Here we're going to read the path of size from the uh, incoming channel. And as soon as when this the number with this size, number of files with this side hits our threshold, we send them off on another channel to be actually hashed. Um, but uh, if there's not we haven't yet reached that threshold, we just record that we've recorded them, uh, we've seen them. And then finally, if we're already over that threshold, then we just need to emit the new path with size to be hashed. Does that make sense, sort of sense? Yeah. Cool. So um, then we've got our actual hashing here. This is take a new channel here. We're going to read these paths um, 
with size in, and we're going to hash them. Um, I'm using directional channels here, this little arrow by the channel uh, thing means that this is just a channel I can read from, and this helps me catch mistakes in my code where I might be um, doing the wrong thing with a channel. This one here, um, it, um, it calls this function path with hash to actually get the hash, and then just writes the output uh, to another channel. As these Go runes are running concurrently, this means we should be able to fully saturate all the CPUs um, on, on the machine. I mean, it's uh, if you're used to doing just single-threaded programming, given that most modern CPUs have typically minimum four cores, maybe up to eight, 16 or more, if you're only using uh, one core, you're using a fraction of the percentage of the power of your computer. And I've written and used so much tooling written in Go now that I actually get annoyed if I see a program just using a single core. Like, my life's too short for single core. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah. Um, and we'll show this running uh, shortly. Finally, um, the path with hash stuff is pretty um, is pretty simple. Um, hash returns piece hash. Uh, this is for a single path with a size. If we know its size is zero, then we know it's hash already. This doesn't just evolve, avoid um, a computing the hash when we already know it, but it also involves the, the system calls to open, read, and close the file. And when you're writing high performance code that's interacting uh, with the operating system, the less you can interact with, uh, the fewer systems calls you can make, the better. Um, then it's just a question of opening a file. Um, the hashes in Go have this sort of IO writer type interface where you copy the data into them and it computes the hash. So that's what this line 168 is doing. Um, I'm gathering some statistics here and then I return the actual hash itself. Finally, uh, almost finally, we accumulate the paths by hash. So we're, um, this, uh, this channel here, we're now going to be getting these paths of hashes coming over. The hashes are um, they're arrays, not slices. So they're actual, um, I think it's 32 bytes as a block of memory. It's not a slice, which is a slice header pointing to an underlying array. And this means we can use it, use it directly as a map key. Um, map keys and goes as go as you know have to be uh, comparable and here we 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 simply just build up a list of hashes to file names now we can wait for everything to finish this error group stuff does the magic for us um, the error handling in this code isn't perfect certainly um, it's error handling with concurrent code is hard because stuff continues to run even after you've incumulated the error and how much effort you go to cleaning up after you've encountered an error is, is very much up to you. Bear in mind that once your program terminates, the operating system will free all resources for it. So messy, for short-running um, short programs like CLI commands like this, I think it's OK to not diligently close every single file, network connection, etc. Of course, if you're writing long-running server code, then you need to be much more careful. Finally, we find the duplicates. We've, got, we've now got a map from hashes to file names. Um, if uh, for each one, if the um, if we have more than exceeding the threshold, then we build a little result map here, which is now now instead of being a map of the hash bytes, we now encode these as strings, as hex strings, um, and we write this as some uh, human or well, some some uh, JSON output. And we'll print some, uh, print some statistics as well. That's it. I'll show you it running now. But hopefully you can see the, the flow here. The key concepts being um, channels connecting different components, a lot of Go routines. Uh, there's no use of sync. All the synchronization is done through the channels. Um, I do use Atomics for commu uh, computing statistics. We'll have a look at that a bit later. Um, but this is generally, if you find yourself using sync, in Go, you might be doing something wrong, unless you're doing something. To know. And if you're using Atomics, then you're really doing something wrong. People often think that Atomic, their, their version of Atomics using mutexes is going to be fast on the, the standard library. The standard library already knows all of these tricks. Like, uh, you saw the amount of detail that Roman went into parsing. People who write standard library functions go into the same amount of detail in the functions they write. So let's run this.
So um, I'll just build it. I had a nice demo on, unfortunately, my desktop machine, which I now can't, which has nice 16 cores, so you can see all of them being used. Sadly, I broke the network connection, so you have to hit running here. But actually, I will do it on this one. So this uh, is BTOP. I'll make it um, a bit bigger. What's nice on here is the top right, you see the CPUs being used. This is an Apple M1 Mac, so it's got eight, uh, four performance cores and four efficiency cores for a total of eight. I have absolutely no idea how Darwin schedules them. Um, and I will, but what we're going to do, I'm just going to make this a bit bigger. Maybe, so let's get hub, duplicates, and find duplicates. Uh, let's, uh, with these, oh, we're going to that in a sec. This is just a whole bunch of code um, downloaded from github.com. Uh, it takes a while to run, which is good because you can see the cores are starting to be used in the top right. And we get out a whole bunch of, of JSON here. Um, we can look at some of the performance on this. Uh, I deliberately chose something that runs a little bit slowly so you can actually see that there's an effect. And this is what I like to see. Now, this is 428% CPU. My computer has done roughly 10 seconds of work, um, sorry, uh, in five seconds, roughly. Well, 20 seconds of work in five seconds. And this is what you should be looking for from your, your concurrent code. Um, we can actually see how some of these, uh, the, the optimizations we've done uh, help here. Uh, I've had this little minus s, I collect some statistics. We'll look at that in a sec. Um, and here it found in this case there were a quarter of a million files, but we only had to open 70% of them. It's not less system calls. The total size of the files that we looked at is whatever, it's roughly 66 gigabytes or so, but we only actually read 40% of that of this. And when you when you think about making things go fast, you can make things fast by micro-optimizing. You can, uh, but you can generally make things much, much faster by avoiding having to do any work in the first place. Um, and then finally, if you really have to do the work, then using concurrency to share it across multiple uh, CPUs um, is a great way to get get a speed on. But it's when you're going to for performance optimization, first thing: can I avoid doing the work first? then try to do it fast, then uh, do I need to do it in parallel? And if you think about classic computer science algorithms, they're all like this. I mean, quick sort, for example, splits the array into two dots, and it knows after it's done the pivot that it doesn't have to compare one set of the numbers against another set of numbers. They are separate. Um, so it avoids working. Um, the final thing oh, I'll show here, if I change the threshold, uh, remember these numbers, that 40% of bytes hashed. I say now we need at least five identical files for it to be considered a duplicate. Um, this should run faster. Now we've only needed to read actually 13.5% of the files because only there's for the only way fewer cases where there are five or more files with the same size. Um, with this structure, um, with the, um, the this connection of uh, channels to con uh, to basically you link these processing units, if you want to add in extra code like this, the prefix matching, another option would be say hash the first four kilobytes of the file and use that check that first to avoid having to read the whole file. We can easily add them as extra uh, extra steps in here. The overall design, although it's a fairly long function, is actually fairly modular in um, uh, in its approach. And this is a nice example of um, Go's channels being similar to pipes on, uh, in Unix. In pipes in Unix, you're communicating text between um, uh, different processors. Those of you who use PowerShell, is there anyone here who uses PowerShell? Okay. <laughs> I think it's actually quite nice. I just to test it myself. But um, it's uh, PowerShell, you actually get type uh, objects uh, between, um, between processors. And in Go, of course, you've got the full programming language of typed objects flowing over, a, uh, over channels. 
The final thing I'm going to point out here is I used, I said don't use sync atomics. Uh, sync atomic, I do actually use atomics, where as an example, um, the statistics total bytes add, uh, this is atomic thing. I think this is an okay use of atomics, um, but there's something special about this statistics uh, object. I think Ma Michael already knows why this is. Why, why are these weird, why have I put these unnamed fields of 56 bytes in between? CPU sorry? CPU alignment. Uh, CPU, yeah, sorry, your CPU alignment. Uh, I mean, these are, a UN6, uh, UN64 is eight bytes, and the compiler will put it on, align it on an eight byte binary, so it's not, it's, you're very close. Yes, yes, exactly. And what, the, so this is, so each one, uh, each uh, value is on a separate cache line. Why is that important? Because it can be accessed in different ways. Exactly. So, uh, to the, as we've got a lot of concurrent code here, um, these uh, different Go routines are going to be operating, updating these different statistics at different times. If I packed all of these four counters together, so they're in consecutive, there's a chance that Go will put them consecutively in memory. And that means um, they will probably all sit on the same cache line. The cache line is a group of 64 bytes, line of 64 bytes. Boundary, which is the level at which most uh, modern CPUs went. As the now, I mean, contention between CPUs basically happens on cache lines. By forcing these values to be in separate cache lines, we avoid the um, avoid the contention at the CPU level while updating the statistics. Of course, um, Go routines updating the same statistic will will conflict on that, uh, which is why I've gone to the effort of adding as large a number as possible each time. For example, um, here when I'm counting the number of DER entries, I try to count the number of DER entries once instead of uh, statistics dot DER entries dot add one. This, this is going to cause like, more confliction. So yeah, so that's pretty obvious. Yeah. Can you just use channels for this scope? Like in the end, there's some things so you can just like. So yes. Absolutely. A good question. It'd be interesting to see. So this proposal is to use channels instead of this and basically send things over a channel, have a go routine which receives the um this I think it's probably gonna be uh, in the channel there's probably at least some synchronization. Michael's nodding his head, which is good. Three good. Three, okay. Three remixes in the channel. And uh, the Go routine that you are spinning up, it's also scheduling work. <coughs> so it's going to be waste just to module it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, oh. If these guys are nodding, it's a really good sign that I'm not <laughs> saying nonsense. <laughs> okay. Um, that was other stuff I was going to mention. Um, other possible improvements to this? Other ideas? Ways this improve? Yeah. Uh, all of the channels that you're using, they're unbuffered. Yes. So that means that uh, the Go routines can only hand over uh, execution, so to say, whenever they're all aligned. Like yeah. You can only write to it whenever somebody else is currently reading from it. Yeah. So any uh, channel buffer size will probably have a positive effect. You could just add comma 10 after all yeah. of these. I can, I can only do powers of two, I'm afraid. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's make it really big. Uh, you have a, a general thing with channels that normally the channel size should be zero, one, or you should have a very good justification for any other size, but I think this counts as a, yeah. as a justification. Uh, what I like to add is just mention in a comment that the size there was chosen arbitrarily. Yeah. To prove that not blocking. <laughs> 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 well, the way it looks right now, it looks magic, but it really is. <laughs> okay. Um. Ah, good point. And actually, what I will do as well. Uh, actually, I'll run it without first. Um, and I'll run it this one, and the output will go to dev null, which means we should just see the stats. 
Um, this is really poor man's benchmarking. We don't know anyone. Yeah. Ooh, yes, nice improvement. Thank you. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Do people understand what the difference the buffer channels make there? Is he nodding? Anyone want to ask a question? Okay, cool. There's, uh, oh yeah, and one final thing on the code. So, map, Go's maps are not concurrency safe. Why does this work? Single thread. Exactly. Yeah. This is um, maps and concurrency uh, are a dangerous mix. There are some um, some stuff in the standard library to help you, but a really good uh, design to follow is a single map should be owned by a single Go routine, and then you don't have to worry about it. Um, fun war story. Um, it used to be like back in the days of I think Go 115 or so that the runtime wouldn't detect concurrent access to maps. And the company I was working at had a very clever programmer who knew exactly when it was safe to concurrently um, have concurrent access to maps and exactly when it wasn't. Of course, then the ground go 115, 116, then introduced the check that detects for current access and none of the code uh, ran for more than about 12 milliseconds for any more. And it took several months to actually unpick uh, all of the optimizations that this clever developer had made. Um, yeah, that was not good. Anyway. So anyway, so that's pretty much all I got. That was hopefully a nice little, a sort of run through of real Go concurrent code, a few touches on performance there, a nice way of seeing how Go allows you to make the most of the CPU that you're running on. Uh, this is something I, I will definitely go ahead and implement the uh, some of the optimizations, thank you for the buffered channels and the yeah, go for it. I just have a question because yes. before in, like, I needed to actually look at the implementation again because you're check, checking whether something is not in the right frame line. Yes. You want files, but this could eventually break the string as well. So you might actually be running this command over, I don't know, that not, for example. Ah, uh, so. Um, is this intended? Yes, yeah, so I deliberately ignore everything which is not a regular file. Yeah. Oh wait. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I, I, I imagine like yeah. reading the last one. Okay. Yeah. There's. Sorry. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So the the, the I node includes the type of what it is. It's like regular yeah. file, something etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, yeah. Cool. Right. Uh, one more question. Did you consider xx hash sixty four? I did not. Should I consider xx hash sixty four? Uh, I was I was into this topic as well. Uh, into the topic of uh, very fast caching when I worked on Black Hat. And yep. XX hash sixty four proved to be extremely efficient. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it's a non cryptographic hash. Uh huh. Uh, is that, what type is that? Uh, this is the other one. Uh, I use the. Uh, <laughs> Oh, good, good. Yeah, chess buddy, I guess. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's Italian, I guess. No, it's uh, called Caleb Spare. C E Spare. Ah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 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 Excellent. I will. Um, I will definitely check these out. These are they're really nice because I do actually use this. Program quite a lot. It solves a real problem. Yep. One thing I'm not quite sure because I didn't read the source code. Does this seem to limit the number of Go routines? At the moment, there's no limit on the number of Go routines. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. One line change. In it is. It's. Let's do it in the hash run, uh, hash paths. So currently, it's. I spawn one Go routine per directory that I walk, and one Go routine per file that I hash. Um, I'm going to optimistically say that we don't care too much. We can do it both. Actually, we can just do um, error group dot set limit. Um, for hashing, is CPU bound? Uh, I'm going to put two. 
That's because stuff will be waiting for I/O, and we want to make sure we've got some work to feed the um, uh, feed the CPU. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Does anyone use the magic number detector linter? Okay, it's horrific. It's so. Um, you, you, I hope you're running GoLang CI lint on your code. There's a lot of really good linters in there. Some of them have, are really quite opinionated. And the magic number detector will basically, any constant it sees, it will ask you to redefine as a top level constant with a comment. <laughs> and sometimes it's pretty freaking obvious. Ways. It's like, it's pi. Obviously, it's going to It's like, <laughs> you know, eight. It's the size of a unit at 64. I do not need to document this. Anyway, it does then. Um, so. <laughs> Would you do that at work? Do you do that at work? No. <laughs> <laughs> I get from your pretty stuff. Oh, yeah, true. <laughs> 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 Actually, the, the, sorry, magic, the, the first compiler bug I ever encountered was to do with zero. It was an uh, Intel 80196 embedded chip, which um, the registers were mapped to memory addresses, low, like zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. And register zero at address zero was had two bytes of zero. It's a 16-bit chip. The trouble is the compiler was generating 32-bit compares to zero against this 16-bit value of zero and whatever is address two, addresses two and three, which I think was the output of one of the ADC uh, and like the digital converter pins on the uh, on the chip. So one time in 65,536, my zeros would be equal to zero. And the rest of the time, they would be some random uh, non-equal. <laughs> and that was a bug in the compiler. And you actually had to define a constant 32-bit zero and make sure that all your 32-bit <laughs> uh, yeah. OK, right, I'll make this the last thing. So I think we're probably out of time. I've got to build it. So I change. I don't know if this will have an effect. Um, da -dunk, da -dunk, da -dunk. Oh, it's taking a bit longer. So. Um, uh, yeah, pretty graphics don't really give us proper uh, details, but yeah. So it looks like you know we need to keep make sure we've got, we've got enough code routines running to, to keep our CPUs. Make it from, 64. Yep. Uh, for which one? For the walk, the walking directories or the hashing? No, there's a number of CPUs. Okay, <laughs> that's going to be a lot. And the same on this one. I need a constant now. If I define a constant, I change it in one place. So. <laughs> Uh, I want the other one. I love benchmarks based on one run on a laptop. <laughs> <laughs> it's a variable CPU frequency with no idea what the schedule is doing. But this is running. yeah, the browser. <laughs> oh, it's slightly faster. There you go. That's helpful. Yeah, I might. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. That's all I got. Thank you very much.